Hello and welcome to the third episode of our Understanding Class by Eric Olin Wright Reading Group series. Today is Monday the 21st of June 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue on our way through Chapter 1, from grand paradigm battles to pragmatist realism towards an integrated class analysis and begin to tackle the work of Max Faber. You can find the link to the Google Slides we are discussing in the show notes. This week, I have the new patrons, Baktash Babadi, Derek Varn, Radix, Laurie Coombs, Thomas Cruz, Alexander B, Salt PDX, and Kevin YZ Chen to thank. If you like the sound of extra patron-only episodes, hanging out with us all over on the Emancipation Network Discord server, or joining in the patrons' Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution reading group series, why not head on over to Patreon, throw me a few commie dollar. It helped me keep stacking books on my shelf and food on the table. Okay, let's hit it. Okay, last week we went through the kind of stratification stuff. Our first chapter is towards an integrated analysis. We're going to look at the stratification stuff, which we've done, and then we're going to get into the Weberian class hoarding and finally deal with Marxist exploitation and domination. So let's hit it in here. Let me see, where did I leave off? So we got class as opportunity hoarding. So this is kind of essentially Marx Weber type stuff. Uh, let's have a look here. If a job confers high income and special advantages, the holders use various means to exclude others from access to these jobs. It calls this social closure. I thought it was interesting. He talks about citizenships, citizenship rights as a special and potent form of license to sell one's labor in a particular labor market. Like that, in America, that's seems to be particularly a important type of social closure. It's, yeah. it's, it's in a lot of places. I mean, I don't know yeah. about, like, if you're not an EU citizen, it's pretty big in Europe, too. Having tried to get a job there, it's damn near impossible in certain places. Like in East Asia, if you're not a citizen, your legal status is is severely curtailed as far as jobs go. In in Japan, they uh, specifically fought the American occupation authorities on uh, making sure that uh, non-citizens would have uh, no special legal protections under the post-war constitution because, uh, you know, they had a history of uh, exploiting lots of Korean immigrant labor. uh, And I suppose, uh, you know, that was a big deal. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, that's kind of a thing that always like freaked me out living there. I was like thinking, like, yeah, like I really have any rights actually. Like, I just, I'm just kind of here at the the pleasure of the state. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. It was like that in uh, K- Korea as well. Although they were beginning to give us some legal rights, like for example, the English translation of your contract had to be legally the same as the Korean one that you signed that they didn't tell you it was what it was um the, that was a thing when i first went there well it's like uh was it didn't the british do that to the maori in new zealand they made them sign uh, like an english version that said something different yeah. than the maori one and they're yeah. like oh well you signed the document bozos well that, hap- that that happened with indigenous people like all the time quite a bit but but that became but that did become a legal controversy in new zealand because you know which okay we're gonna do the letter of the law which law you know like which contract are we going to zero in on because they're two different contracts and and, and which one esri let me guess the, Ma- the maori one won out in the court yes dear <laughs> okay pat, pat pat it's interesting because my instinct here was that like that uh, it was more of a thing that was important in the in the western countries as a way of kind of controlling like immigration, you know, economic immigration. But if you go to, like, I remember being in, in in Uganda and they have very, very strict ownership rules over land and stuff like that. They, like, say as a, you know, European or something, you can't go in there and buy land. You yeah. can only own, like, up to, I think, 49% of any piece of land. You have to get a local person to co-basically sign it. So it's it's not just a simple, like, first world thing. It's also used by you know, developing world or the global south to try and keep out global capital, you know, kind of exploitation to some extent. Yeah. Highly used in that in those contexts, actually, and, and more restrictively so. But 
it tends to, however, not stay just to fight against, because eventually what happens is class labor with people with higher educational status are needed and the locals can't get them. So they make exceptions for Westerners who they're trying to keep out. But then other poorer minorities from even more underdeveloped countries become a primary issue. So for like if, if as an American in Mexico, it was very easy for me to get a lot of perks that are legal but you know i can't own land. i technically can't own land in mexico but they would find like yeah but we have this lease where you can kind of own it for 100 years and you'll be dead by the time you don't own it anyway whereas if i was guatemalan it would be a different story so it starts off trying to trying to keep out you know the big bad imperialists but it usually ends up being a way to keep even people in even uh, scarcer situations down. I think people often don't understand this too when it comes to like immigration from Central America because Mex like getting through Mexico is brutal for a lot of those people. And the immigration regime there is almost as bad as anything in the United States in regards to that. And it's not an entirely dissimilar phenomenon that happened in Kashmir where basically like property rights were restricted to, to Kashmiris only, predominantly to prevent the absolute economic takeover of Kashmir by Indians. And part of the huge deal last year, when the Modi government basically ended the special relationship status with Kashmir and cut off their internet was essentially to open up the, the Kashmiri property markets to Indians in order to provide Central. primitive accumulation for Indian capitalists. And settler probably is it yes, as well? Yes, it was absolutely. It's it's absolutely a settler colonialist project. You, it's funny you mentioned like India, like because I remember reading in the Economist magazine they were always given out about India, probably because it was such a massive market. They were saying Western capital, we can't go in. We can only be like a forty nine percent share in any country. They were given out about why Walmart can't get into India and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, fuck you, Economist. Yeah, that was my analytical response. But it is interesting where we're on this, though, how much, for example, it's easier to get into China, which is supposedly not a capitalist country on some of these capitalist grounds. It is uh, India. And the way this the way this opportunity hoarding is used actually as a settler thing in places I think leftists don't study. I mean, honification of a lot of the mountainous regions. Yeah. West China, quasi Mongolia, those areas that that also follows the same patterns of you know, forcing open land acquisition to private parties, favoring them and economic deals and whatever that really actually increases the settlement of the area. And that's in a country with like official national recognition for 18 different groups. So it's super common. And it's it's something that when pe when people ask me why I think it's important for Marxists to understand Viberian class analysis is a lot of imperialism actually functions way more on Viberian lines than it even does the way we describe Marxist ones. Because not that Marxism actually doesn't handle, it's not, it more or less doesn't handle this. It talks about imperialism, but it doesn't, Marx doesn't deal with legal structures and licensure in this way, except in a couple offhanded comments in the critique of the Goethe program. It's not really part of his worldview. It's it's um, much it's much more a focus on the exploitation in production and and surplus as opposed to the initial just exclusion. But he does deal with exclusion in in capital. You know, like the clearances are essentially a Viberian part. Yeah, I I, I say that not to say that like he's a po like he wouldn't recognize this analysis because he clearly would have. It just didn't come up in capital because it's not part of the. The capitalist circuit, except in the in the way that it's sometimes using primitive accumulation, but it also, I guess, it's it's how labor aristocracy exists too. And we right. think of labor aristocracy as just credentialing, but it's also like anything that requires a license to do is an opportunity hoarding. There's even good reasons to opportunity hoard because you like you don't want every person who has a crack whimity to claim to be a doctor. So you limit the opportunity of people who don't have the education to do it. But there is a side note of, of that. And that's like the ADA in America has, or the the American, is it, is it not the ADA, the American Dental Association, the AMA. AMA the American yeah. Medical Association. Yeah, they're basically a glorified cartel. <laughs> I mean, like. Every, um, in every nation, Derek, it's not just America. Every nation, the doctors are an organized cartel. 
Like not they're in Cuba. Yeah, not in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> but they they do act as like in in Ireland and England and all these things. Like they act as a break on they act as a break on NHS. They act on as a real break in Ireland and getting an NHS equivalent going right. You know they they really are they are one of the strongest I would say in nearly every nation. Just uh, talking about like you don't want everybody to be a quack doctor. My mother has a bit of a quack doctor. She recommends she reads she reads these things and then puts them gets other people to do them. So our neighbor was this old guy who's like in his mid eighties and he had like really bad chill blains and she told him oh, I read somewhere that rubbing raw chilies on them is really good for them <laughs> and so he did he did it and like it was just it was sheer agony for about a week <laughs> oh, dear. i also oh wanted God. to focus on this part of opportunity hoarding at the bottom here before we move on to the next one labor unions can also function as an exclusionary mechanism by protecting incumbents of jobs from competition by class outsiders this is actually the key point in distinguishing industrial unionization models That's versus nice. guild unions yeah, because yeah. guild unions function this way, and people get mad at me when I actually say that effectively about fifty percent of all unions that exist in the in the West are guild unions by this category, yeah. because I, they they exist to. I mean, tap more in America makes it almost inevitable that like is it not more? Is it not it might, more? It's probably all of them, frankly. It's it's yeah, because like the the model of industrial unionization was all about for lack of a better term, the collective worker was about the sort of like instantiated solidaristic uh, spirit and long-term instantiated class interests. Whereas like guild unionism is much more, has a much more imminent rationality to an employment situation. It's like, I don't want people to take my job right now. <laughs> and if you think about the types of work in the United States that can maintain having labor unions, it's, often because they don't try to set their sights on liberating the whole class. It's shitty, but it's just, well, it's, it's what it is. It's also legally under Taft-Hartley. They literally can't right. set their sights on, on liberating. But I mean, yeah, they can't do wildcats. They can't do solidarity strikes. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, the people do wildcats anyway. Those are always illegal, but like solidarity oh. strikes would become, if, if a, if a union endorses a solidarity strike, it can lose its union licensure. Right. And this is, I think why, I actually think people underestimate this for the fact that a lot of workers in the U.S. have anti-union sentiment because this was also used in the early 20th century to keep racial relations kind of tense because the unions often were racially exclusionary and particularly before industrial unionization. So you get back to the Knights of Labor and like they were like cheerleading the Chinese massacres and shit. Like Potterly, like at first condemned it and then like when his own, he was the leader of the Knights of Labor and then later on was like, well, okay, yeah, technically killing Chinese people is bad, but, you know, they were taking your job, so I'm going to split the baby. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Also here, like, I don't know if we focus, it actually really is on the emphasis on, like, property rights as a pivotal form of exclusion in capitalist society. I do think it's pretty interesting because that's the one, besides, like, well, that's the form of enclosure that Marx is, like, most interested in. And it is a part of his theory. And so it makes it not so much of a stretch to include other forms of social enclosure that aren't just property rights. There is a debate between like sort of third worldists and classical Maoists. And one of the interlocutors is like, look, a job is not property. And in a certain respect, a job, of course, is, I don't know, in a literal respect, job is, of course, not property. But in opportunity hoarding, you can see conceptually why a job people can be covetous of their job as if it were property there can be a class system around keeping competition away from your job in a similar propertarian sort of way it's not literal but there is basis in marxism from the property enclosures to analogize this class process it's not like out of the spirit of marx in English, right. it's it's like in in linguistics when you have like metaphorical extension of a of a word to to be used in different contexts. Like because the property rights are so baked into the way that the culture functions, and on a very sort of basic economic sense, like 
using those systems or patterns of thought and and metaphorically extending them into other areas is kind of a a natural thing that you would expect. So in in a propertarian society, you would you would have people seeing basically everything that is uh, economically useful or important as some form of property, like you know bits on a computer and intellectual property and these kinds of things are basically metaphorical extensions of real property into other aspects of uh, social and communal life. I, I just have one thing to say about this private property rights, which is that, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot where the Marxist case is kind of a special case of the Weberian one, but it's also seems to sort of like, have outsized importance relative to its position there. Like there's some kind of weird categorization problem where it doesn't fit in a subordinate position to the Weberian uh, categorization, yeah, even no. though it technically is. Well, you could say that the others are like, it's the original sin and that the, you know, that opportunity hoarding is. I don't think so. I mean, I think I think what's going to complicate it is very old, right? Yeah, the the thing is, it's the private property and the exclusive rights of private property at Clay's capitalist class society, because, for example, opportunity hoarding in forms of rents is the basis of manorial and feudal society, right? Like, it, that's okay, how yes. it works. Yeah, no, I I think that's kind of fair. It seems to just be like a supercharged instance of of it, which changes the whole dynamic of the system. Perhaps it's it is the... the base of it? Yeah, no, that, that's, no, that's yes. totally that's totally what entered my head, because I'm like, I still have the old historical materialist model plugged into my brain here, and it's like, it's hard for me to not think of the property enclosure as the fundamental like class distinction in society. Not to say there aren't other important ones, that's the whole point of this book, but like, this is the thing that makes different modes of production or whatever you want to call them different from each other is how property enclosure works. Like who owns whom or who's allowed to own stuff or who in fact owns stuff. Yeah. How does land ownership yeah. work and how does land tenure work? And, and I mean, I will say this is where the, the classical Marxist modes of production get weird because when you try to apply yes. them to feudal societies, it's like, uh, yeah. There's like 50 here, not one. But... <laughs> yeah. No, a feudalism is in, in a way like harder to understand than like ancient societies by this metric. I just want to throw this out here because I think it's going to become a point of controversy. But I would say that the, the way we understand Marxist understanding of class or this kind of like special case of the Weberian understanding of class is probably in some kind of like weird dialectical superposition that is going to cause this entire uh, neat analytical framework to get really funky. I, I think, I think there is, there is, there's something weird about this that is going to make this quite messy in the end. It does actually. When I talk to, I interviewed EO Wright, right, like in 2014 in the Infinite Loss interview that I keep bringing up. But the, he tried to explain the way he drew out the scale after adding all these things together. Because he had these early scales in his first book on class that like were very neat and parsimonious and symmetrical. And they were like, there's nine and there's this, this, this. And, there's... and he basically said that was impossible to do once he tried to reconcile this. And he came up with like a 32-point asymmetrical grid. Kind of then, and then, you know, and he's like, he didn't, he told me he hadn't finished working it out when he wrote this book. And from what I can tell, he never did. He never finished working it out. Because, I want to see that grid. But he tried to describe it to a Moga and I, and we were confused and lost. And we're like, I don't even know how to edit this because like, should I keep it in? Cause I don't know that I could, but it was over the, the fact that the Weberian becomes a special case of the Marxist and the Marxist becomes a special case of the Viberian when you try to it's add It's dialectical! It <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. 
air horns, bam, 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 dialectics. Yeah, no, no, that's that's uh, that's essentially it. Uh, you know, the no, nine no, place Eric Olin Wright diagram was used to direct a bunch of research. So I could only imagine the fabulous, complicated, insane research that would have came out of that thirty-two place one. A girl can dream. It gets it gets made fun of though by like MMTers and stuff the nine place one because a couple of the categories really do seem like they're just there because you needed a companion category. They are like if, that's just if you physics if, envy. It's a consequence of you know letting the analytical kind of brain keep going without kind of like I don't know switching on and being like does this category actually exist you know because if you have like two axes and most of the categories exist. You can just cross a couple off because they're logically tenable but not realistic. Like you could do that if you wanted. I have a new I have a new rule for this reading group series. Do you want to hear it? Every time we're on a slide and somebody says the word dialectical, we move on to the next slide. That's how we know we're fair, finished. Fair, fair. Okay. We need a real air horn. I have to go, I have to get the dialectical air horn. <laughs> Okay. Oh, as we said the word, we have to move on. <laughs> oh, we don't even get to do this. No. no. Uh, so we're on to the next slide. Class is opportunity hoarding. Okay. Let's see. We got the main difference between opportunity hoarding and the individual stratification attribute mechanisms we did last time is. Dun, dun, dun. Firstly, opportunity hoarding means the economic advantages from being in a privileged class position are causally connected to the disadvantages of people excluded from those class positions. Marx! <coughs> okay. And uh, secondly, simply, the rich are rich in part because the poor are poor. Class struggle! <coughs> uh, yeah. We're not even quite at class struggle yet. We're, ju we're at a... This, was, I, this is what I learned class was before I got into Marxism, and it's just like a depressing... It's the sort of Foucauldian picture, actually, in a way. It's like... Like people are poor because they are rich, but it's all so complex and woven together, and there's all these customs supporting it. So, or you know, good luck with that. <laughs> if you don't like this, well, you know, good luck with that. We you don't actually get to an image of overcoming until we get to the next section. Anybody want to talk on these two? We'll just go on. Well, I mean, what is interesting is is Weber into it. Uh, the, one of the key points of Marxism is that economic divisions are relational. And Weber gets this in a way that other liberal class theorists just avoid. But unlike Marx, production is not... The reason why, for example, when you look at Weber's special categories is because production isn't prioritized as the, as the primary generator of, you know, stuff. And why you care about these other relations. Instead, Weber pr treats all relation at, relational hoarding as equal. Which, okay. <laughs> like fine but also that's not how we experience it in real life because because someone having cultural capital over me like only means a whole lot outside of my ego if it also limits my ability to get stuff and unless you're working on like the mandalorian or something what people think of you on twitter doesn't really affect your job outcomes that was very current that won't edit well nope sorry Too current dear. yeah Too current. okay let's let's move on We've had enough kind of talking about Judaism to get into Zionism, Megs, or you're going to get a channel banned. <laughs> I'm sorry, what, what was that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, moving on, without a dialectic. Class as exploitation and domination. Okay, who wants to take this one? Somebody want to take this one. Tiberius, welcome to the void. Okay, what am I, I don't know, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Neither do I. Okay, so class as exploitation and domination. That's that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, associated with the Marxist tradition of sociology. I don't think that. Here's what I think. They have to say this: domination isn't associated with the Marxist tradition of sociology. Like it's it's not brought up that much. It, oppression is, and later on, EOW will get into how oppression is actually different from domination. He used I, to I, call I, domination exploitation, like a like a different category of exploitation, and realized that he couldn't make it work. I can read this passage where he gets into this. Both domination and exploitation refer to ways in which people control the lives of others. 
Domination refers to the ability to control the activities of others. Exploitation refers to the acquisition of economic benefits from the laboring activity of those who are dominated. Yeah, so he goes he gets into this the difference between say like a a prison guard who dominates you but doesn't earn from your exploitation. It's one that's interesting because conflating domination and exploitation is what people do in this PMC thesis crap. Yeah, I remember. I, I couldn't tell if somebody was joking last time, but someone thought in the chat thought it was very problematic that Eric Olin Wright didn't think that prison guards exploited prisoners. And it's like, no, no, no. They don't exploit prisoners. They dominate them. And it's like very important to understand what the difference is. And conflating these categories turns your brain to mush. I guess I would push back that the Marxist tradition doesn't have this in it because the Marxist tradition has this whole theory of, you know, state capture and instituting class dictatorship. And while it's not like, while a lot of Marxists don't think about how this would actually structure class on the everyday level, some of them did. And like certainly whatever like bong rip post-Althusserian circles that Eric Olin Wright was in before he went analytical, I think they probably did. And um, Derek, can you explain what you meant there about the the PMC analysis? The PMC analysis, which treats the PMC as a class, sees the primary focus of the PMC as domination of the economy. This is actually going all the way back to the MC theory of James Burnham, which was a repudiation in Burnham's mind of Marxism. I, I, where, I do say domination, Derek, in the in the sense that they dominate the direction. But not they dominate the direction and they dominate the political manifestation. They, quote, manage. I mean, the professional managerial class, it, it's actually these motherfuckers, and I'm going to call them, I'm, I'm not going to miss words, are beginning to use this theory by Aaron White to move between three different notions of class at the same time. So you have this management who dominates management who dominates society because the exploitation is all hidden and diffused through capital ownership. Um, which is some degree even true, but Marx and Engels had already predicted that that was going to happen. The idea that the PMC are the primary class of society because the the bourgeois are no longer actually in control because production really doesn't matter is also conflated in this. Although none of the people who who invoke this actually admit that's what they're arguing because it would mean they're no right. longer Marxist and they're trying to claim to be Marxist at the same time. You say that the production no longer matters. What because? because the production is outsourced in the economy in such a way that it is ba they don't say why actually they don't, they don't know why yeah this, yeah, was, okay. this was the subject of we did an, a swamp side episode on the managerial society by uh sam francis this like you know no, racist. you did the the, the the leviathan one not the man i'm sorry society. no you're right it's excuse me it's called um leviathan and its enemies that's drawing off of james burnham uh managerial society and this in the hands of the guy that we were reading, Sam Francis, it becomes a crypto, like racist right wing theory of class, which has this Faberian, like it does have this Faberian class sociology underneath it. Like, but but it, Burnham and Burnham is crypto too. I mean, the the managerial is yeah. like which managers are you going to side with? And because because the true ownership of capital isn't relevant anymore in the early days, it's because capital ownership is diffuse. But when you talk about the current theories of it, as expressed in uh, and things like the bellows to bring it up again, it is literally just having a degree makes you a PMC because you're a knowledge worker. Knowledge workers are professionally managing society. And because. I guess all values fake or something. I don't know what they think is going on because they don't state it. They get to like metaphors from history about black smoke or what the fuck ever. And they conflate domination, exploitation and oppression as if they're all the same thing. And all these credentialed people, which are, which, you know, is this elite 40% also 40% is an elite. No, um, elite 40% <laughs> of the society um, that, that dominates of which so when i spell out what they're actually saying is what i'm trying to do they're conflating at least three different class theories they have a, they they're basically saying that production doesn't matter but they won't actually admit that's what they're saying they'll also say that basically the petite bourgeois are the working class are they strongly imply it so because they still do physical labor <laughs> 
which which kind of resonates with the American conception of, of workers' identity, which is not anything like we would have wanted it to be. Yeah, uh, so it's says, the blue it's the blue collar cultural workers identity versus the productive capacity workers identity and the domination thing is why i keep on saying instead of going to this pmc bullshit why don't you leave eric owen right because his his discussion of domination gets you out of these conflations immediately yeah part part of what those professional managerial class pmc theorists are are getting towards is because marxists that read, you know, Capital Volume Two and Three are like, whoa, production isn't the only thing in the economy, and because their notions of causality are very, I don't know, binary, where like either something impacts something else or something doesn't impact something else, and you know, there's no room for mutual interaction and causal asymmetry at the same time. Like, so once they realize that, you know, exchange and you know, consumption and all these other economic processes have an impact on production. They lose the picture of production being the dominant force in society. It was sort of su Marx as a supply side theorist, you right. know, like, well, I, I, my only, my only response to that Esri, is that most of them actually don't read past capital volume one. And when things don't fit the capital volume one picture, they basically just kind of, ad hoc invent shit sure um, but there there are intelligent marxists that read all three volumes of capital want to push back against the productive labor only you know volume one only version of marxism and because in my view they have trouble thinking of interaction in terms where you know one factor is still causally has this great importance it's the same discussion about the causal interaction between forces and relations of production or between base and superstructure where there is mutual interaction, but one of them is holding the card that can really change everything. And that doesn't, make, that doesn't make the other, you know, interacting actor completely epiphenomenal or useless, but it's just. A it's, lot of them are also like highly, either explicitly or implicitly highly nationalist. And yep. basically take what happens outside of usually the the UK or America to be like almost entirely disconnected and just not at all a part of the analysis. It starts with methodological nationalism and goes into political nationalism almost yeah. all the time. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Where's the surplus but, coming from to give us our to allow our monopoly fucking rents to come from? It doesn't matter. Let's just look at the nation state. Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah, want, I, PMC. I PMC is communing with Cthulhu to channel surplus from the nether realm. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's, it's I mean, part of their evil conspiracy. But the, here's here's what I think the PMC thesis speaks to, and why everybody's quoting it, and why it seems real to people on a like commonsensical level. It is because opportunity capture, and particularly because of domination and opportunity capture, because the person that you hate in your job, and I've been saying this for years, since I read this book, because it like clarified something for me, because I also was like, I hate my boss. I don't actually hate the owner of my job. I really don't. Like, like I don't deal with the person exploiting me. I deal with the person telling me what to do. And and the domination theory immediately, it was, was oh, the person exploiting me is why there's someone needs to dominate me in the first place, but the person who I'm going to experience so this is why when people talk about lived experience or class, I, I bring up the, the Badurian versus the Marxist thing because I think they're both true. My experience of class is Badurian. My the objective explanation of why this exists is Marxist. So like my experience of someone of my boss telling me what to do is that my boss can suck a blanky blank and I hate them, except when my boss is nice to me and then I love them, right? <laughs> and then but the reason why that exists is actually the larger structure capital. And you know what, you know what, but people have what blows people's mind in the implication of why they avoid some of what this says. If you take this at its face value, managers, because of their continuing of the of the of the productive circuit, are actually also being exploited unless they're paid in terms of capital gain. So unless they're paid in terms of stock. And 
And that blows people's fucking mind, and they can't accept it. But <laughs> well, they could be, they could be played, they could be paid in cash. They, they might necessarily be exploited. It's not like the form of your your pay doesn't well, no, uh, uh, exploitation. Well, and a lot of tech workers are. I mean, I have a lot of friends since... paid in ownership. Like you got to remember that. You're paid in stocks. You're paid in ownership of the company. Oh, I know, but like you can be you like uh, you can be not exploited. Like a boss can pay you above what what your value is. That can happen. It happens in IT. People are making bank in IT in some because I, IT is not IT doesn't actually function on the on the normal production value because it's no okay. correct 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 correct. But I, I mean, like in certain specialized things, you like in say for example, guys working on uh, oil rigs in the North Sea, they make bank. Guys working in in uh, in in mines sometimes they make bank. You know, like that. The, but the, they're still the, exploited. They're just exploited at a less efficient level. Not necessarily. Like the the, the business. Can you be think that the business is paying? The, the, the uh, business can make such an, a monopoly. Like, say, for example, there's a spike in gold production in the price of gold. Like, you you can get paid above the cost of your. You know, you can get paid. They can make profit even though they don't exploit you. They can make profit on uh, on like a. Uh, no, it, it's, I, it's, I don't think I don't think it works that way. If that doesn't make sense for extractive resources, because the fact that they make a super shit ton and can compensate you a lot, but they'll never compensate you everything that you the, did. No, no, there's, no, no. There's, that's wrong. Like, because the price of a, a barrel of oil is not linked to the labor. The price of a barrel of oil is not linked to the labor needed to put into it. So you're at, so you can't get the oil without the labor. <laughs> yes, but it's not linked to the, the labor. It's linked to a kind of a monopoly price that's attained in the market because it's a key commodity. The, like the, you cannot explain. You're mixing the, the, theories of value, Tom. No, you cannot explain. <laughs> well, you cannot explain the changes in the price of oil with respect to the amount of labor that goes into it. It's just not the case. And thus, there are certain commodities. You don't explain this is a technical you don't point. The, you don't the price in anything by the value of labor. That Dialectical. No, no, no. But I'm actually like, this is basic fucking Marxist economics in the sense that, like, if you think yes. you can predict price off of off of LTV, you're nuts. I know. Because you can't. <laughs> I know that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are there can be sectors where workers can basically get a wage that is not an exploited wage, and that firm that's operating in certain key sectors makes their profits not based on exploitation mainly, but on other factors like the like the, the extraction of monopoly rents. But, but, okay, if it's, if if we're dealing with monopoly rents, sure. The issue that we have with extractive commodities like gold and oil and those is that futures okay. fuck this up because they when don't. you're all yes, they do because few like they don't like they there's don't. not a monopoly price on oil. Like there <laughs> isn't. It's have a free market OPEC? price. Have you heard of OPEC? It's not the only provider of oil. Have you seen what happened to Venezuela? It's I know that. OPEC, but, but OPEC. Like, Oh, Venezuela. Well, Venezuela is not in trouble because of its production of oil. It's in yes, it is. It's in. It's in. It's in problems because of its sanctioning the sanctions on its oil production. Let's get it that was, straight. Whatever, I, Tom. I, I, you're I, actually I, just wrong. I think, so, I, think like, should, I think we should walk back to something a little more tractable. Because <laughs> okay, there's an interesting pr uh, thing to be had here, Derek. I agree with you, but ultimately, for management, right? There is the potential, and I. I will say this. I don't think the potential is there. Tom, you know, you might disagree. That's okay. We'll talk about that another time. But there is a potential for management to not be exploited based on rents or something. But for the most part, managers, like, unless you're the CEO, unless you're the top dog, like, managers are exploited. And they're dominating. And they're not exploited at the same rate as the rest of the workers. And in fact, in a way, all the managers are doing is sort of, like, securing the value production of other workers. So it's, you know, it's kind of a puzzle. But what this does is it dissolves with dialectical acid. The, uh, oh, oh, the, oh. oops, yeah, yeah. You see what I did there? Yeah. It, it dissolves the easy moral picture that the classical workers movement has, but also what this like, you know, reactionary PMC kind of thesis has. It dissolves both of the easy moralisms of, okay. of those things. To Tom's point a little bit, especially in regards to like IT workers, tech workers, that kind of thing, EO Wright does have this, this passage here. It says, highly educated professionals in some categories of technical workers have 
sufficient control over knowledge, a critical resource in contemporary economies, and skills that they can maintain considerable autonomy from domination within work and significantly reduce or potentially even neutralize the extent to which they are exploited. And I think that that is part of the reason why that sort of lived experience of the working class that Derek was talking about can feed into this kind of like PMC thesis feeling, having a truthiness to it. Yeah. Although I, let's talk about the tech sector for a second, because this is where like getting your Marxist economic categories are really important. And Tom was actually right on this. Tech intellectual property isn't a commodity unless it's made so by the state, by artificial scarcity, and thus requires a strong state to make so by the state, by artificial scarcity. If if you remove IP from the tech sector, it's free to reproduce are fucking close to it. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I used oil. That's why I was using oil as an example whereby well, oil, there, oil, is a, there is a product where the but the product's price is way, way above its actual cost of production. Oh well, yeah, 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 but but it, but and that's why I mean you can get a next. You don't necessarily you can be a skilled Tom, worker you, in oil are, and not be exploited. I'm not sure that that's true, Tom. A, if you're making a profit, you are still being exploited. Even if like if those companies can make a profit, even if they can make a profit from monopoly rent, there's exploitation happening. the The issue is you're trying to no. have your you're trying to you're trying to be a marginalist in one sector of the economy and a fucking labor theory of value theory in another, and you can't. Well, yeah, oh, like... there's there's surplus flits between different places, and it's sucked from different places, and that can override the need to exploit in, but, in but, certain but, but, minor but... minor cases. But I do agree full heartedly with what Esri was saying with the next with the example of like you you're a manager in McDonald's, right? You're still being exploited. You know, and that's I'll... the key point. But also, like, it leads to it leads to dumb shit, like people thinking they can have socialism based off one commodity, even because it's a labor extracted commodity monopoly. And then when that fails, they blame sanctions because they're fucking morons. We should Let's square off about this in a in a, in a dedicated ring. way in a at ring. some time. <laughs> yeah, in, in a one hundred thousand part of Capital One reading series. So don't don't <laughs> challenge me to a ring. All right, <laughs> a, a one hundred. I like that. Top years a one hundred thousand part capital reading series. That, that's probably right. Where we do all four volumes and the Grund Reset. Oh, God. Can you imagine? Oh, do, do we do, yeah. do we do Death both? of the Universe do we do would occur both, before uh, that finished. Yeah. <laughs> do we do both yeah. versions of the economic manuscripts that they're based oh, off of too? Fucking shoot me. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, the, the, the universe will be heat that, you know, all our books will be dissipated throughout the cosmos by the time we finish that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The difference between Marx and Marxist. Marx dies before he writes capital. <laughs> Marxists die before they read capital. That is 100% true. That is, that, that's going to be like, Kyle looked like he was floating for a kind of Joe Biden, uh, the premier, 18th premier of Joe Biden line with the Cthulhu, but I think Ezra, you might have just got it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say this, this PMC thesis sounds like it gets into Pol Pot territory if you take it to its logical conclusion. Mm, you have smooth hands? Hmm. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Phronic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Thank you.